Construction of a building requires brute power to move large and heavy building materials, as well as the precision to place them in exact locations. All safely, of course. That's the job of a crane. There are several types of cranes. The main crane for Bethany Children's Outpatient Project will be a tower crane. These cranes have exceptional weightlifting capacity, height range, and a long reach. Its stationary small base footprint also makes it easier to coordinate activity on site. But before we see more of it in action, let's see how the crane got built and learn more about how it works. As with all construction activities, it starts with safety. The experienced crane crew completed standard project safety training and site-specific training. A third-party safety inspection of the assembled crane took place prior to putting it in operation. As observers, we stayed within a designated observation zone during all times of activity. And because it was an August summer day, everyone on site had regular reminders of managing heat and sun stress. Everyone had plenty of access to water, electrolytes, sunscreen, and ample breaks. Some of the safety planning surprised us, like getting FAA approval. So before any crane structure goes up, you always have to coordinate with the FAA. So the FAA governs all the airspace, especially with your, we're within two miles of any airport. So there's a notification tool online we go through. Um, and you say how high your temporary structure is going to be and you actually have to coordinate how high your new building is going to be to make sure you don't have to have lights or you know, specific communication frequencies and those things that might interrupt you know, air traffic control or you know, air flights going, taking off or landing at an airport. So with Wiley Post being about a mile and a half away, here at Bethany, we had to make sure that our temporary structure is not going to uh, interfere with the airspace. There's actually a, a uh, landing and approach just to the west of us. Uh, if this building was on the other side of Rockwell, so within a couple hundred yards, this would be a completely different scenario. So we coordinate what well, we did about three to four months in advance of this crane going up um, to make sure that um, there's FAA clearance in place and that Wiley Post puts out a notice to you know air traffic folks to route takeoff and landing approaches away from this area while this tower train's in place. Of course, there were plenty of other preparations that took place before crane erection day. A crane needs a strong base. On this project, a piled foundation base is being used. Four piers were set in the ground to support the crane. Each was 36 inches in diameter, set 58 feet into the earth, with 10 feet of penetration into the bedrock. On top of those piers is a reinforced concrete foundation with anchors and brackets to attach to the crane. The first piece of the tower was used to set these anchors and brackets to ensure that everything would line up exactly with the rest of the crane pieces. All of this concrete was allowed to cure and strengthen for a specified amount of time before the crane could be erected. Which brings us to the big day of watching the crane go up. But before we see that, now would be a good time to go over the parts of the crane and how it works so you are familiar with all the terms you will be hearing. And I have a great prop for this part of the video. Manhattan provided me with my own model crane to build and study. Since we've been talking about bases, let's start at the bottom and work our way up. This model crane shows a different kind of base. This is a ballasted base or a cross brace where heavy weights are stacked around the base of the crane to give it stability. The vertical part of the crane is called the mast. It is built in sections, which not only makes it manageable, but it allows it to be built at different heights based upon the demands of the project. As we go up the mast, you see this special section called a climbing unit. This right here is called a climbing unit, and if the tower crane has to go taller than max freestanding, 
you'll tie the crane back to the building and then this section here will separate. It separates the horizontal from the vertical and what you see right here is a tray where then the crane will pick up and trolley in another tower section and when the horizontal is separated from the vertical you can slide another tower section in and then set it back down, pin it together, suck the climbing unit back in and then put the ram into the climbing lugs and start the process all over again. So tallest crane I've had so far in my career is 786 feet in Austin, Texas on the Austonian. So uh, they can go a lot taller than that. Uh, the Burj Khalif had them at 2,500 feet. This project does not require those final heights, so you won't see these pieces on the one being built. The turntable. This is what the top of the crane spins on and allows for a full 360 degrees of positioning. The operator cab. This is where the operator spins his entire shift. And yes, he has to climb a ladder to get up there. So how do you operate the crane? So this particular tower crane, there are two joysticks and they go all different directions. So on your left joystick are your, I call the big movements. There's a, what we call a dead man switch on top. You push down on the dead man switch so the switch knows that you're actually operating. You didn't just bump the stick. You're there to operate. So you push down on the switch. Left turns the crane to the left. Right turns the crane to the right. When you push it forward, we have what's called a trolley, which you see sitting right there. That green thing, it sits on the jib and hangs off of there, like a kind of like a skate. It skates down the end. So when you push it down, the trolley gets pulled out to the end of the jib. Pull it back, it gets pulled into the end of the jib. Now your fine motor function, which is going to be your winch cable, is in your right hand. Down, forward is down, back is up. It's pretty straightforward. I personally love my job. You know, it's like playing a big game of, you know, the claw machine when you go to the arcade, if you've ever seen that. A lot easier to play this one because the claw machine's tough. The jib. This is the working end of the horizontal part of the crane. The trolley. The trolley slides on rails, allowing the load to be moved radially away from the mast. This circle shows the reach of the crane on this project. The trolley motor. The trolley motor is connected to the cables that move the trolley back and forth. The hook block. These pulleys and lifting hook connect the cable to the load being lifted. The counter jib. There's a lot of weight in the jib and its components even before the load weight gets added. The counter jib acts as a balancing weight on the other end of the crane. The counterweights. What you call your counterweights. So when you have something on the hook out here and you trolley all the way out there to the tip, the crane doesn't tip over because you have all these weights to counteract and counterbalance the crane. The main winch and motor. This is the power behind lifting and lowering the load. This motor is 210 horsepower and has a lot of weight, so its placement on the counter jib also helps balance forces. When we showed up at 8.30 on a Saturday morning, work had already been going on for over two hours. Two mobile cranes were being used to unload the crane trucks and lift the crane pieces in place for assembly. Each of the four corners of each mass section has brackets that line up with the section below it. Once in place, heavy tight tolerance pins are hammered into place to hold it. Each of the four legs has two of these pins oriented perpendicular to each other. When it gets to the right height, the turntable and the operator cab are hoisted on top. From there, pieces of the counter jib and jib start getting added in a particular order to keep things in balance. Before the last of the jib goes up, the counterweights are added. Here is a time-lapse look at the crane going up. This is called a Zoom Lion. Uh, this was actually designed by two German, uh, Franz Joost, who is the 
grandfather of all superstructures for tower cranes. He's designed the Italian crane called the Commodil, the French crane called the Poitain, uh, the German crane called the Peco slash Piner, and now this crane here called the Zoom Lion. So uh, he designed the superstructure and the company that was used to be called P&J Archimet, uh, my owner, Peter Yela, designed all of the uh, electronics on it. So he designed it to swing and act like a Piner crane. But these are frequency driven cranes, which being a frequency driven crane, they're no more longer direct contact. It's a lot easier on the parts and they don't break they don't break down like the older style type of tower cranes. This is actually made in Changshaw, China. Oh, man. And uh, it's in a brand new factory. Zoom Lion is the world's largest engineering firm. They own a lot of companies all over the world. Uh, a lot of companies that a lot of people wouldn't even realize that they own. But they are the largest engineering firm in the world. This crane, particularly here that you see in the United States, is specific to the United States. You cannot find it anywhere else in the world. Uh, we designed it to our specific electrical uh, specifications and uh, the capacities that we wanted the crane designed for. So that being said, it's been absolutely fantastic. The first one in the United States came in in November of 2015 and was erected on the Rolex headquarters in Dallas, Texas. And uh, we now have 33 of these tower cranes in the United States and they've just absolutely performed beautifully. And of course you got your slewing. This is your turntable, which allows the crane to swing 360 degrees. And then all these pieces back here are called counter jibs. And then all this out here is called your, your jib. And the full jib on this specific tower crane is 278 feet, 10 inches, or since no tower crane is made in the United States, they're all European, it's 85 meters. So this specific crane out here can pick 5,510 pounds out of 278 feet. 10 inches. And in a two part line, it can pick 35,275 pounds. In four part, it can pick 70,000, uh, what, 550. So it can pick quite a bit. This is what they call a 32 metric ton crane. 32 metric. 32 metric ton crane, yep. Mm -hmm. So pretty neat. Yeah. So. So. Well, in real life, if you took those out, it would do this. <laughs> so, there again, they're there to counterbalance what you put out there on the on the hook. Yeah, don't don't violate OSHA regulations. Don't violate OSHA regulations. That's right. <laughs> when we had to leave, the counterweights were going up, and three sections of the jib were being assembled on the ground to be lifted into place. Soon thereafter, all the pieces were in place, and the cables were strung and the crane was inspected by a third party. Monday morning, the crane looked like this and was already being put to work. As you can see, it's like a choreographed dance of equipment and not needing mobile cranes on the construction field makes that easier. What you see here are more piers going in, which will be its own video later in this series. You may be wondering, what happens to the crane and its peered foundation when they're done with it? The crane crew will come back, take it down, and load it on trucks to go back to the crane yard. There, it will go through a full inspection routine and put through a maintenance program, assuring that it's in tip-top shape for its next job. A concrete floor will be poured over the crane's foundation, and that area will become part of the auditorium lobby. We hope that you have enjoyed this look at tower cranes and that you are enjoying this series of construction videos. We're looking forward to our next visit and have a deep appreciation to Manhattan Construction and all of their partners in giving us this opportunity. See you on the next phase of this project.